Um, I, I was reminded of a time and a message that I heard when I was 18 years old. I'm going to pull up, pull up the picture here. Uh, this was 2000, Passion One Day 2000. It was three days in Shelby Farms, Tennessee. There were 40,000 college students gathered. It was like a Christian Woodstock. All right, 40,000 college students gathered. It was raining. As you can see, there's a picture up there on the right of the stage. We were just to the right uh, of the stage there. And uh, there's me and my crew, uh, two of my mentors, um, and then some other homies. The one that I'm next to there is a pastor. Uh, I got my Addicted to Jesus t-shirt on, as you can see there. I don't see my big, I can't tell if I have my big, uh, I had a big like dollar sign. Well, no, I, I went from the do big dollar sign to a Jesus emblem uh, when, I got, when I became a Christian. Big silver necklace there. And uh, so I was a new Christian, been a Christian for about a year, year and a half. And I heard a message um, that, was, that was formative to me by John Piper. And he was talking about boasting in the cross, in the cross alone, the 40,000 college students challenging them not to buy in to the American dream, not to waste their life on vain things, but to live for the glory of God. And he shared a story about two missionaries in Cameroon who were in their 80s who were killed in a car accident. They lost their lives. And they had poured their lives out to serve the poor in Cameroon for many years. And he asked the crowd this question. He says, was this a tragedy? Was this a tragedy? These godly women who served on a mission field for years poured their lives out. And people started to just reply, no, no, this wasn't a tragedy. These were women who lived well, who didn't waste their lives. And so, and then he, he pulled up another story from Reader's Digest about a guy named Bob and his wife Penny who took early retirement from their jobs in the Northeast for five, um, <clears throat> they were 59 and 51 and they, they lived in Florida where, where they could cruise under 30 foot trawler and play softball and collect shells. And he said, that's a tragedy. He said, imagine standing before God on judgment day and saying, look at my seashells that I've collected. And there was something really powerful that struck me that day. As a young Christian, I realized that I had been called to live for something so much more than the American dream. And I was, I was determined that I am not going to settle for less and buy in to this American dream and just have a comfortable life and retirement. But I'm going to live for the glory of God and I'm going to proclaim the gospel and I'm going to pour out myself to reach as many people as I can for the sake of of the gospel. And by God's grace, I've been on that trajectory for the past 22 years. And I intend to stay on that trajectory. As at turning 40 last year, I can feel more temptations to start thinking about stuff like retirement and 401k, which isn't a bad thing, life insurance and those responsible things that you need to think about in this season of life. And, and I have this, I, I feel more of a pull towards comfort and I want to push back on that seeking to live a comfortable secure life that doesn't involve taking risks for the gospel's sake because Jesus is worth it and church you're worth it that I that I give my life to serve to feed, to lead, to equip, to encourage and care for those that God has brought here to City Church Garland. And when we stand before Jesus, I want to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 exhorted, in essence, he exhorted the Corinthian church not to waste their life. I've titled this message, Don't Waste Your Life. He says, 2 Corinthians chapter 
6 verse 1. I'm going to read the first two verses and then we're going to, we're going to kind of work our way through the text. We're going to cover the whole chapter, Lord willing, today. And I'm just going to kind of, for the sake of for trying to bring it together, I'm going to slowly work through each little section here. But we're going to start in 2 Corinthians 6. Let me pray. Father, as we open up Scripture, would you open our eyes? Would you speak to us? Would you move us on to your agenda? May our joy increase as a response to hearing and applying your words to our lives. Shine the light of your truth into our hearts and free us up to be who you've called us to be and to do what you've called us to do. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. Working together with him, then, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Or don't waste your life. In other words, for he says, in a favorable time, I listened to you, and in a day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So here's our big idea. God has given us so much grace in Christ, having forgiven our sins, reconciled us to himself, and brought us into his family. Since he has done this and, all, and, and also has given us the privilege of representing <coughs> him and working with him, we must diligently pursue faithfulness and consecrate our lives to him. Now, first of all, let's look at this, this first little phrase here at, in chapter uh, 6, verse 1. He says, working together with him. I love the portrait, the, 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 the vision that Paul gives for Christian ministry within this letter. Okay? Okay. It's more than merely working for God. Here he's saying working with God. Okay? God has invited us in to be a part of what he is doing in the world. He's given us massive purpose that has eternal implications and effects. We've been invited into this. And as, as I've said before, when we talk about evangelism... I, I like to think of it as uh, uh, finding out where God is working and joining in with what he's doing in people's lives. And sharing the good news, right? Um, and ministry could be described as that. We, we look to see where is God working? What is God up to? Instead of us just trying to start our own thing, our own ministry, our own work, we look for where God is at work in the lives of people in this world. And we, we aim to... To, to come alongside, to join in with what he's doing. This was Jesus' mentality in the Gospel of John as he described his ministry. He said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only speak what I hear the Father saying. And we see Jesus just walking in this intimate relationship with the Father, doing what the Father had author, authorized him to do. He wouldn't even perform miracles before it was his time. Right? Remember his, his uh, brothers were trying to get him to reveal himself to the world. His mom was like, okay, come on, turn this water into wine. And he gave some pushback. But he, he did recognize that this was the time for him to display his glory, and he did it. So anyways, we see this privilege that Paul had of ministry, of being given the ministry of reconciliation. Being an ambassador for Christ And this privilege and responsibility does not merely only go to the apostle, the apostle Paul, or to pastors who are called into full-time Christian ministry or mi missionaries who are called into full-time Christian ministry. Every single Christian is called to do the work of the ministry. And Ephesians 4.12 says that the role of leaders is to equip the saints... How many saints do we have in here? Okay. If you're a Christian, your hands should go up. Okay. Saints who have been set apart for God, the people of God. 
You see, leaders are to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Okay? And what this looks like is what Paul's describing right here. We're working together with God. We've joined in to his agenda as Paul describes it in 2 Corinthians 5.18. He says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. We're called to be peacemakers, children of God. Those who engage in the ministry, who've been reconciled and engage in the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. You've been entrusted with the ministry, a glorious ministry, and a glorious message, gospel message of reconciliation. May it be burn in our hearts and, and, and overflow from our hearts with enthusiasm to those around us. He says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We get the privilege of working together with God and God working in and through us. And the Apostle Paul said that of himself, and it's true of us Christians. We're all called to make disciples, to be representatives of Christ, to be witnesses for Christ. And then we also see here in, in uh, verse, the second half of verse 1 is we see Paul's exhortation, his plea for faithfulness to the Corinthians. Okay? Okay. Now, I don't know how much time you've spent in this particular verse and, and have thought about this, but this might be uncomfortable and disturbing for somebody here, and that's okay. And, and that's what I love about, one of the things I enjoy about preaching through the Bible is we're going to come across verses in the Scripture that we don't typically go to in our quiet time. Like, they don't, they don't, they're not the ones that we gravitate towards, and this might be one of them. This, this is a good stern warning that we all need to hear as the people of God, and the Christians needed to hear it, and every person in this room needs to hear this today. He says, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. We appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Now, for me, that, that raises a number of questions, and, and I hope it does for you as well. What does this mean? What does this look like? How could, how could I, and if I were to, how, what would it look like? And so a couple of uh, modern translations, um, the NLT, New Living Translation, describes it as this. It says, as God's partners, we beg you not to accept this marvelous gift of God's kindness and then ignore it. That's what some of the translators do with it. Eugene Peterson in 2 Corinthians 1, uh, in the message, he paraphrases it as this. He says, companions, as we are in this work with you, we beg you, please don't squander one bit of this marvelous gift that God has given us. Grace. Amazing grace. So what does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? He's writing to the church. People who are in the church, the Corinthian church. And, and churches are made up of both those who are, are, are true Christians and, and those who are may, maybe seekers or, 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 or think they're Christians and they're not Christians. There's, there's both within churches. And so one commentator says this. He says, Paul appeals to his readers not to receive God's grace in vain, i.e., not let the response to the gospel be marred by entertaining criticisms of that gospel or of the one who brought it to them. As we've uh, discovered in this letter, there were some people uh, in Corinth, there were leaders known as super apostles or um, or false apostles, Paul called them out, who were leading and influencing the Corinthian church, leading them astray. And some of them were in danger of being led astray. And um, 
And Paul seems to imply here that if you're, if you're led astray by these guys and their message that's a twisted, perverted gospel or not a gospel at all, distorted gospel, then there's a, there's a vainness of receiving what, what you've heard. You've, you see, Christians have re- received the message of the gospel. God's gracious message that in Christ our sins are forgiven. Right? We believe that. Yes. Our sins are forgiven. But we must be aware of accepting a version of Christianity that has forgiveness but no freedom. <laughs> okay? That, that uh, we must be aware of accepting a version of Christianity that does not accompany a transformed life. Paul has said in chapter 5 that if any man be in Christ, he is what? He's a new creation. There has been some significant change that, that has occurred in the life of this individual. They have heard and received and responded to the grace of God. They were not just merely, Christians are not just merely hearers of the word, but we're doers of the word. Genuine faith is displayed in our response to what God has said. What is just like genuine love is displayed in our actions for one another. There's fruit, there's evidence. And Paul says, don't receive the grace of God in vain. I just wonder how many people are are in churches and have been in churches all their life and are just going through the motions and they think they're okay with God, but there's little or no fruit, good fruit in their lives of salvation, of regeneration, of being born again, a child of God, as the Bible describes children of God to be. Those who practice righteousness and those who love the brother. 1 John 3.10. And I get it. This is a heavy message. But I would rather, if there's anybody in this place or who hears this message, I would rather you hear it now than on the judgment day and stand before Jesus and hear those words, depart from me, I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness. Knowing Jesus changes us. We get eternal life, but we get changed. From the inside out. Grace transforms us. And Paul has already written about some of the effects of grace upon the Corinthians or upon uh, believers. He says, uh, for for this is for your sake in 2 Corinthians 4.15. For this is all for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. When we encounter and experience the grace of God, it makes us a grateful people. We're filled with gratitude. There's a close connection between gracia and gracias. The grace of God and gratitude. Living a life of gratitude. Okay? And that's what Paul says here. And it also leads to giving glory to God. Those who experience the grace of God. Uh, 2 Corinthians uh, 5.15 describes that the grace and the gospel that we the we we experience is uh, he he died for all so that those who live may no longer live for themselves but for him who for their sake died and was raised from the dead. You see, the gospel of grace takes a death blow to narcissism and selfishness in our hearts and in our lives where it's no longer the world and everyone else orbiting around us, but now we we orbit around the Son of God. He's the center of our lives, and we are His servants. We are uh, His children, His people, and we are servants to others for the gospel's sake. And this is some of the effects. The Apostle Paul makes it very clear that the effects of grace is life-changing and transforming. And he was calling the Corinthians to live lives that match up with the message that they've heard. With the message that they initially received. He was calling them to display the fruits that should accompany those who are followers of Jesus. David Garland says this. He says that Christ's death must change the way we live here and now on earth. Not simply ensure 
ensure our entrance into God's uh, eternal presence. Anyone who expects to live in the resurrection must respond properly to Christ's death. The response requires more than intellectual assent to the proposition that Christ's death atones for sins. It must mold how one lives. This response provides the essential criteria for discerning who truly belongs to Christ and who does not. And those who do not belong to Christ, those who belong to Christ do not live for themselves. So, so there's, there's two ways that theologians have, have tried to make sense of, of this um, idea of not receiving God's grace in vain. Either theologians will say, here's, here's real Christianity right here, and if, if you don't bear fruit, then you, you're, you're probably not a Christian. If there's not evidence... Or there's, there's those who would say, well, you know, you can, you can be saved and then lose your salvation or turn your back on God and, and, and turn away, right? And so this makes sense to me. And if you have questions about this, we can talk about it. I'm not trying to start any theological debates here. I'm just simply presenting what the Word of God says and then wrestling with, what does this mean and how do we apply this to our lives? God forbid that we should check it off and just immediately think, well, this doesn't apply to me because I'm saved. Right? This does apply to us. This is important for us to hear this and respond to this. Uh, Scott Hoffman says this. He says, only perseverance with ever-increasing glory constitutes evidence that the Spirit has really transformed one's heart. Only those who continue to live for Christ as the one who dies and was raised for them can be confident before the judgment seat. Those who begin by trusting Christ but then fall away to another message show that their initial reception of God's grace, though it may have appeared genuine at the time, was not real. Now I get it. That may be offensive to some, but just trying to make sense of how's this work and what does this look like for for Christians. Paul makes it pretty clear what it looks like to not receive the grace of God in vain. So if we'll just stick to scripture and look at that. 1 Corinthians 15.10. He says, but by the grace of God I am what I am and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them though it was not I but the grace of God that was with me. Right? So Paul says, here's, here's the evidence that the grace of God was not in vain in my life. I worked hard. He was not working for salvation. He was not working to try to earn salvation, favor, or forgiveness, or a place in heaven with God by hard work. He was working as a response to the grace of God he worked harder than the rest of the apostles. And then he gives credit to, he gives credit to the grace of God that was working, that was with him, that was operating in his life. He gives grace to the, the powerful, transforming grace of God to make him who he was, to enable him to be who he was, and to do what God had called him to do. And so what are some indicators of receiving God's grace in vain? There's some rotten fruit there. So as I just kind of thought through, and, and perhaps you could add to this list, but here, here's some indicators, I think. You're more focused on the things of this world than the eternal kingdom of God. Okay? Okay. You spend more time discussing and quarreling about secondary issues and politics and conspiracy theories and controversies rather than Christ and the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. You spend more time on entertainment and hobbies rather than evangelism and discipleship and study of scripture. You can quote more movie clips than you can quote Bible verses. You spend more time scrolling news media social media rather than studying scripture and seeking for ways to live out what you've learned from the scripture. Your bank statement displays little or no investment in the kingdom, in kingdom causes, such as your local church, missions, ministries that serve the poor and the needy. The Apostle Paul gives two chapters 
two chapters on calling the Corinthians to live a life of generosity and to contribute to this collection for the poor in Jerusalem. And he explains to them, here's what the gospel looks like. Jesus became poor for us. This is the grace of God. He became poor for us to bring us into all the richness that we have in Christ. And those who have been changed by the gospel of grace live generous lives. And that's a value that we have here at City Church is joyful generosity. Conversion should also affect our pocketbooks, our bank accounts. And Jesus had a lot to say about this. And he, and he stepped on people's toes when he did because he knows, he knows the reality that where your treasure is, that your heart is also, will be also. You attend church merely for socializing and network rather networking rather than encounter God and worship and hear his authoritative word in your life. And so here's some indicators. And if this is something that anybody here is concerned about, you want to talk about, I'd love to talk with anybody about this after. And so let's look at Paul's life as an example of perseverance and difficulties. Here's, here's some expressions of, of ways that Paul displayed not, not receiving the grace of God in vain. Here's some ways that he lived it out and his ministry and his life is, is an authentic evidence of one who's been transformed by the gospel of grace. He says, but we put no obstacle in anyone's way so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by great endurance, in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. And so there's a number of different hardships that he describes here. The afflictions or troubles or oppressive experiences that put various kinds of pressure on him. The hardships or the difficulties that one cannot diminish. The stresses and, um, or calamitous situations for which one cannot escape. The, word, the Greek word pictures a person trapped in a confining place. Sufferings inflicted for other people. His stripes or beatings uh, or punishments delivered up by a whip or a lash. Imprisonments in Paul's day involved confinement and discomfort. And tumults or riots as well, he described. Um, and also there's hardships inflicted that he inflicted upon himself for the sake of furthering the gospel, such as labors or hard work. That encompasses all the strenuous act. This encompasses all the strenuous activities of life, including manual labor. Paul was a tent maker, and he sweat for Jesus. He bled for Jesus for the for the gospel's sake. He wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty and work hard. Jewish people have valued work and and and. Manual labor because God's designed us to be workers like him in his image. Uh, sleepless nights. Fastings and hungers. He missed, he missed meals for the gospel's sake. How many meals have you missed for, for the sake of seeking God? Now we're really stepping on toes. <laughs> Fasting is the... The, uh, uh, the, the forgotten spiritual discipline in 2022, right? And yet it's something that Jesus taught and, and, and his followers have practiced throughout history. And of course, we don't do it to uh, try to earn favor with God. We make room for God in our lives through fasting by denying ourselves food that we have the right to eat and enjoy and thank God for, for the glory of God. But we deny our stomachs and we, we use that time and that energy and that focus that we would otherwise put on food and cooking and consuming food and pursuing God in prayer and study of scripture. And so this was Paul's life. This is what he, he points to in contrast to these false apostles uh, who look down upon Christian ministers who would go through such hard times like this. 
You know, for, for in, in, with the worldly mindset that many of the Corinthians embraced, this was like, this isn't supposed to happen to Christian leaders. But Paul is challenging their perspective and what it looks like to be an authentic minister and leader in the body of Christ because we follow a crucified Savior. And then we also see Paul's proven character in verse 6 and 7. He says, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech and by the power of God with weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. So here's, here's some evidences of the grace of God that has marked the Apostle Paul's life. There's character, there's integrity, there's love, there's genuine truthfulness of speech. And then we also see paradoxes here in, in his ministry, verse 8 through, through 10. He says, through honor and dishonor, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors, yet true, as unknown, yet well-known, as dying, but, and behold, we live, as punished, yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. Now, this is the paradox of Christian ministry. This is the, a paradox, a kingdom paradox that Jesus talked about. The, uh, the kingdom paradox where uh, the way up is down. If you want to be great, be a servant. If you want to be exalted, humble yourself. If you want to experience life, then lose your life. Give up your life. Right? If you want to be blessed, give. Be generous instead of hold on and hoard. Right? And so it's, it's the paradox that, that, that Christ calls his people into. And, and Paul's describing that paradox in his ministry. We're not going to focus on, on each one of these this morning, but let me just highlight one of my favorites here. And it kind of goes with some of the testimonies that were shared here this morning. As sorrowful, yet rejoicing. As sorrowful, yet rejoicing. How can those two go together? Right? We can just completely stuff the reality and ignore the reality that life is hard and not grieve well. And just put a smile on your face and act like everything is okay when it's not okay. But as Christian, God, as Christians, God teaches us how to grieve well and to groan over the reality that this world is not like it's supposed to be, not like the original design that God created it with, the good design. We have corrupted God's good world. And so we grieve over that. Like, why is it like this? And the Bible gives us some answers. Okay, but, but still, it's, it, even though we have some answers and explanations of why the world is like this, it doesn't completely remove the painful reality that this stinks. This, this does not feel good that my dad has to die. Or that my mom has to get cancer. Or that I'm losing my sight or my hearing or, or, or that I lost my job or whatever, whatever the struggle or the suffering or the trial is that you're going through and that, that you've been through. We live in a post-Genesis 3 world that's broken. We wrestle to make sense of it. We wrestle to find hope in the midst of it. This, it's not supposed to be like this, that, that my marriage just dissolved. It's not supposed to be like this. And so Paul has these really powerful words right here that I think are so helpful if we'll just reflect on these and embrace all the other biblical truths that are wrapped around these as sorrowful yet always rejoicing. We can, we can simultaneously walk in both. We can grieve well. We can be... Uh, and I love how Ecclesiastes says this. Um, 
in, in regards to grief, it says that sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. Right? Sorrow is better than laughter, for by a sad countenance, the heart is made better. And so the way that I see that, the way I understand that is that, that a, a part of the path to healing and wholeness and finding joy and gladness is, is not denying the reality that it hurts and, and it's painful and, and, and what you're going through, uh, not denying the sorrow and the grief, but acknowledging it and letting your faith, your face acknowledge it in your countenance, okay? Instead of putting on a smile when there's not a smile in here, instead of putting on a smile when there's not one in here, just letting the grief come through and the sorrow come through. Because you know what that's going to do? It's going gonna, it's gonna, to, inevitably, it's going to lead to a conversation about that. Right? If, like, why are you down? What's going on? And so to avoid the conversations, oftentimes we just kind of put on the smile. Like everything's, I'm okay, you're okay, we don't need to talk about it, you're good. Right? But if we let the sorrow come through our countenance, the sorrow that's in our heart, and we have some brothers and sisters who love Jesus and, and are filled with gospel hope and gospel perspective, and we have conversations and talk about the disappointments and struggles in life, that's a part of the path of finding healing and hope and wholeness through our sorrows and through our pains. And then we're going to be able to properly do what, what, what Paul says that he also does simultaneously, always rejoicing. We can, we're, and he, he calls the people of God to rejoice always. Now, I'm going to ask you, who's ever been annoyed by that, that c command or call in Scripture or by others who say that all the time or call others to that? Rejoice! Anybody? I mean, I personally have it because I'm wired more towards the joy anyways. Like, I'm a, I'm a seven on Enneagram. <laughs> joy, celebration, I love it, right? But, but others, others are like, come on, that's, that's too much. Like, come on, I don't, I, I don't feel like rejoicing right now. Well, let me, just, let me just say this. You have permission to grieve and to feel sorrow and pain and to acknowledge that it hurts. And we as the people of God need to provide a safe place for those around us to talk about that and not have to stuff those feelings and act as if everything is okay and just forget about it and move on. But we can have joy in the midst of sorrow. We can have hope in the midst of loss, despair, struggle. And we, we can have this joy because our joy is not based on earthly circumstances. Paul's joy was not based on life being comfortable and smooth for him. It wasn't based on how many likes he had on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter followers, how many people were commending his ministry, or how many people were criticizing his ministry. His joy was based on this heavenly reality that his name was written in heaven, that he's in the family of God, that he belongs to the kingdom of God, and the king will reign forever, and he's calling others to, to enter into this kingdom joy, righteousness, peace, and joy. If our joy is based heavenly, heavenward, or based in heavenly realities, we won't lose it when earthly realities get difficult, dark, painful, and sorrowful. We call that happiness, right? When we feel joyful or glad when things are going smooth, but then when they stop going smooth, we lose it. That's just happiness, circumstantial. But biblical joy is so much deeper than just having gladness and happiness when things are going well. And so Paul talks about this here. He talks about these really difficult times and this paradox, being sorrowful yet rejoicing, being poor yet making many rich. Paul knew that it wasn't about him. He wasn't trying to get his world to orbit around him. He's trying to point people to orbit around the Son of God, to center around Jesus Christ. The Messiah for their joy. And I love and I love the vision of ministry that he gives within 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He says that we're we're workers together for your joy. For your joy. 
That's what ministry is about. For the glory of God and for the good of others. And so we see this paradox within ministry and the Apostle Paul's ministry. We also see in verse 11 through 18 is we see this plea, another exhortation, this plea for godly partnerships, godly relationships. And let's look at that here. He says, we have spoken freely to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. In return, I speak as, as to children. So kind of a parental voice. He became their spiritual father. Speak as to children. Widen your hearts to us also. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Or what accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will make my dwelling among them and will walk among them and I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Therefore, go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord. Touch no, touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. I will be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Now, this, this section deserves a sermon in and of itself. And I just apologize to you that we're trying to, I'm trying to cover so much on a Sunday morning. Um, but let me let me just highlight a few things here. Um, well, for, first of all, this idea of being unequally yoked. Okay? Now, <clears throat> we're, many of us are not too familiar with yokes, right? Uh, unless you grew up on a farm, um, or maybe you had some toys that, you know, you know little plastic yokes that, that you have played with or whatever. Um, but but the idea of, of the yoke is, you know, the, the, the yoke brings the two animals together for, for a job, for a task, like as we see here, this, this Indian <coughs> gentleman here uh, with these two animals yoked for the sake of doing some work together. Now the idea of being unequally yoked is being mismatched. Think if instead of the, the, one of those animals, um, think if one was replaced with a little goat. Think how hilarious that would be if there was a goat linked up with this other ox or whatever this is. Um, they, they would just be doing circles. They wouldn't be getting much done. It wouldn't be very effective. And this is the imagery that the Apostle Paul is using when he says, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Okay? Okay, so, so there needs to be healthy boundaries. We need to work through what does it look like to have healthy boundaries and godly relationships with Christians and with non-Christians. Because on the flip side of this, we don't want to be those who just completely disregard the people of the world and have nothing to do with them and ignore them. Jesus prayed for his disciples to be in the world but not of the world. He said, I don't ask you, Father, to take them out of the world. Okay? A part of our purpose and mission that what we're called to is to, 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 to reach people within the world. And so as we do that, we have to guard against the compromises and the temptations that we can be drawn into, that we can come into an agreement with that are unbiblical and be led astray. Like the Israelites were in the Old Testament when they linked up with people who worship false gods and idols, and they began to worship those idols and those false gods. This is also true, this is applicable to Christians not marrying non-Christians. If you're a Christian and you're single, I don't see any singles here. Oh, I guess we have some singles here. It, it, should, it shouldn't even be an option in your mind if that brother is or sister is not a Christian, it shouldn't even be an option in your mind for y'all to be together in marriage. Like, forget about the missionary dating deal. Like, 
Maybe I'll just win them to Jesus. I'll win her to Jesus. She's, she's, everything else is perfect except they don't know Jesus. Like for me, that was the first, that was the top criteria for my wife, for Kendall. Like know Jesus, love Jesus, follow Jesus. What's on the inside there is top priority versus somebody who doesn't know Jesus. And so what does it look like? What are some indicators of unhealthy partnerships? So whether that's relationships with somebody, a potential spouse or business partnerships, <clears throat> John Maxwell, leadership um, author and writer, gives four indicators, or five there, of unhealthy partnerships. The parties don't share the same values. The parties don't agree on the same goal. One or both parties must compromise their, con that should say convictions, sorry, convictions. One party selfishly demands that the other surrender, and one party benefits, and the other loses. So here's some indicators of unhealthy partnerships. Right? The, the Bible calls us to, to influence others, but to, but to be wise and to guard against who we're walking with. I mean, this is really important as parents, as we're sending our kids off to school, and, and we're watching our friends form these, our children form these friendships at school, like, we, we don't want our kids being led astray by, by other kids that are going to turn them on us. I mean, just think about that. Think about that. Your, your kids go to school. My kids in public, our three kids are in public school. If my son starts rejecting me and rejecting Christianity and, start, and, and just totally re, like rejecting me because of some influences that he's hanging out with, that's going to be a concern for me. I'm going to pursue his heart. I'm going to do everything I can to point him in the right direction and try to help him make the separation that he needs to make from those friends that he's hanging out with that are leading him astray. And I'm going to do everything I can to impart wisdom from Scripture to him and let him know that bad company corrupts good morals. And the Bible warns us about running with the wrong people. We have some, and thankfully, we have good relate. My wife's on PTA, and we have a good relationship with the teachers there at the school, and uh, there was a, something that happened with one of our kids recently, and, and the teachers said, yeah, is this okay if I should have? Yeah, the teachers, I'm just, just checking in with my wife before I get in trouble. Yeah, and, and so, the, so there was something that happened, there were some, some troublemakers in my son's class, and, and he was kind of going, kind of hanging out with them, and the teachers just called it out and said, Man, you are a good kid. You shouldn't be hanging out with these guys, these troublemakers. And, and they affirmed what they saw, the grace and God's work in my son's life. And they, and they let us know about it. And it provided a great conversation that I had with my son about what's going on with these guys at school. And he let me know about some friends that he had to unfriend at school because of their choices. And I commended him. For that, even before we had to encourage him to do that, he did that, and that just Hallelujah. delighted my heart as a father. And I want his heart to be won over by God and won over by, by us. We want to live winsome lives before our children. So, sorry for a little tangent. Maxwell also goes on and he says, "Good part. Here's some here's some indicators of healthy partnerships. Good partnerships do not foster codependence or in, independence." but interdependence. Every party feels secure, is stretched, and enjoys the synergy. The partnership multiplies the productivity of both parties. I think that's helpful. And so lastly, let's look at Paul's plea for the pursuit of holiness. Verse 7, he builds on what he just said, and he says, Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. This is beautiful. This is a beautiful exhortation and encouragement, a plea to the people of God to pursue holiness in light of all that God has promised, in light of all that God has done, 
and graciously given us and, and done in our lives, let's, live, let's guard ourselves against being defiled by the things of this world. We went camping recently and I watched my four-year-old just get covered in dirt. Like just covered. I mean, he just sat it and played in it for hours. And he was going to sleep in our tent. <laughs> and if you've been camping, you know that it's not fun having sand all up in your tent or in your bed, right? That's, that's a pet peeve of mine, right? <laughs> One of them. Um, and so we had to give him a shower. I kind of joked about uh, there being a splash pad at the, uh, at the camping and it's just one little faucet. You just come under it and you run around. So we're going to go to the splash pad. <laughs> um, you know, the longest, the longest I've ever gone without a shower, I camped one time by myself for about a week. And I went without a shower for one week. Okay, nothing to be proud of here. But I, I stunk. I stunk. And let me just say this. It felt very good to take a shower after having all that dirt and stinking and getting cleansed. And this is something as Christians that we are to do on an ongoing basis. The blood of Jesus has provided cleansing for us. Our sins have been washed away. Right? But we live in a world that's dirty and we still get dirty. Right? As, as, as Peter, when, when Jesus was at the Last Supper with with the disciples, and he began to wash their feet. And Jesus is like, hey, let me, let me wash your feet, right? And, 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 and Peter resists. He's like, no, you can't wash my feet. And then he says, well, if you don't let me wash your feet, I, I, you don't have anything with me. You don't, you know. And so Peter's like, okay, give me a bath. You know, wash, wash all of me, right? And he's like, well, you're already clean. And, and those who already have had a bath, they only need their feet washed, right? Because they're walking around in sandals and you get your feet dirty. And as Christians in this world who have been washed and forgiven and cleansed of our sins, our feet still get dirty. We get dirty living in this fallen, broken world. And we start to be influenced by the ideas and the thoughts and the words and the things that we see on our screens that defile us. And we need our minds renewed and we need to be cleansed and where we've, where we've allowed ourselves to be influenced by these ungodly things. And, and so we go back to the blood of Christ that was shed for us. And we walk in the light and we apply 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to for, forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And we go back there over and over and it just feels good. To live a life that's clean before God and right before God. In honor of God. And not defiling other relationships by all the dirt that we're bringing into the tent. Now, my concern in talking about this, these verses and preaching like this is that I come across as some old fuddy-duddy, crusty preacher. Legalistic preacher. Um, but I just want to highlight that holiness is beautiful. God is a holy God. And, it's a, it's, and the effects of grace upon our life is beautiful. And I love how Jerry Bridges puts this. He says, a disciple learns that you cannot say no unless there's a bigger yes burning deep within you. Often the conversation focuses, in, when we talk about holiness and living a life that's consecrated to God, often the focus is on what you don't do, the movies that you don't go to, and the things that you don't listen to. Like, that's important. That's, a, that's only part of it. Like, what do you say, what do you get to say yes to because you made room in your life for God to fill your life and the beauty of holiness reflects in your life? Christ's likeness reflects in your life. It's not just about fleeing youthful lust, but we also pursue faith, love, and peace, and righteousness, along with those who call out on the Lord with a pure heart. So let me, let me land the plane here with some application. So first of all, recognize all that God has given you in Christ and respond to His grace. Respond to His grace. And fully give yourself to Him. Sorry for the typo. Respond to His grace, surrendering and fully giving yourself to Him. Or as uh, Romans 12 puts it, 
but through the mercies of God, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices to God, holy and acceptable. In response to all the mercy and the grace that has been given to you in the gospel, respond. I'm giving all. Christ gave all for you. <coughs> respond. Respond in surrendering all to Him. And also expect hardships on your journey with Christ. And embrace what He's doing in you through them. Hardships and difficulties. and The, the, the Christian path is a narrow and a difficult way. And there are all kinds of difficulties that are going to come your way. And none of them are purposeless. None of them are arbitrary for the Christian. Each of them have a purpose and a redemptive value that we must recognize and embrace and, and allow God, that even when we can't see it, just trust that, God, you're doing something good in me, like James 1 says. When you count it all joy, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Anybody here need more patience? I'll ask your spouse or your kids. I think we all do. And James goes on and he says, let patience, let patience have its perfect work in you. In other words, like stay in the oven when God has you in the oven instead of jumping out. Let it be mature. Let what he's doing be mature in you instead of always looking for the way out to get out of a hard circumstance. And so here, here's a couple more points of application here. Resist locking arms with those who don't share your Christian values or goals. And seek out those who do. Actively seek out those who do share your, your goals and your values in, in the Christian life. And run hard after God together with those brothers and sisters. Love God together. Stir, sharpen one another. Encourage one another. Because who we run with is going to affect how we run. Where we run. If we run. Then connect and commit to, here, here's a very practical, we have community groups here. <laughs> connect and commit to a community group through which you can pursue Christ's likeness and mission with here, right here in your local church. <clears throat> Get involved where you're known, where when you have a struggle, you can reach out to the group and the group can come alongside and encourage and pray and be there and rejoice and throw a party for you or more, sit there and mourn with you. So let me close with 2 Timothy 2.22, as I've quoted. Flee, so flee youthful passions. Pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call out on the Lord with a pure heart. 